Okay, so uh, welcome back to this YouTube channel that's received no posts since I had a baby. So <laughs> great. Uh, that's, that's, you know, a hard time, good time. Um, I specifically am making this video because a topic has been broached in the Archdiocese of Blade um, about the issue of same-sex attraction, right? Things like gay straight alliances in our schools, um, the, just the general politicking that's been happening in our Catholic schools recently and how that's affecting our teens, how we as youth ministers should address this issue. And so I bring a guest speaker from the States. I don't know specifically where you're at, somewhere in Ohio, I assume. No, you're not so there I'm, right now. I'm from Texas. But you're from I'm Texas. At Francisco University. Yeah. Student, student at Ohio. Franciscan University in Ohio. Uh, I brought Manny in, or Emmanuel Gonzalez, for a talk at one of my youth nights, the youth night right before we had the baby. Uh, the baby came two weeks early, so we had Manny on for youth night, and then literally sometime next week we were in the hospital with a baby. So I'm not. It was all me. I was, <laughs> it was all Manny. The baby yes, jumped he, out. He right prayed after for that. us at the end of the youth night, and then the baby <laughs> then just came out. Went yeah. forth, right? <laughs> Gift of the incarnation just happened. <laughs> That's right. Way to go. Uh, so Manny is a Catholic. Catholic guy with same-sex attraction, SSA. Uh, he's done various speaking engagements. Uh, you were just, we were just talking before the, we started the, uh, the interview about a couple big ones that he's done in the last little while. And he's still a student, so he's got to manage both of those things. Uh, but yeah, he, he talks about same-sex attraction because, well, he knows. And uh, yeah. it's good to have that witness and testimony. And I think it, it, when we talk about the issue, that witness and testimony will be super useful um, for the teens and the youth ministers who are, who are watching this video. Uh, I think that about covers it. Any anything else, many that I missed? No, I just want to say like thank you, James, for having me. I'm super excited to get into this topic. James just talked to me a little bit about you know the context and like specifically in Canada, like um, what's actions. I'm really excited to just dive into it with him because I think this is a much needed discussion, and I think yeah. it could bear some really good fruits. So, okay, so why don't I, I give the context of why this has come up recently? Um, I was explaining it to Manny before the interview. Basically, in one of the most recent school board trust meet, trustee meetings we have here, in, in Canada, we have school board trustee meetings because um, we have a Catholic school board that's, that's in our constitution because French Canadians were the first school to start. It's a whole thing. Anyway, we have a Catholic school board that's publicly funded, but because it's publicly funded, the government kind of gets a say, and we have a really big school board union that kind of controls what happens in the schools, and it's not the Catholic church that controls it anymore. Um, except in name only. And so there is this thing now that they started in, in Catholic schools called gay straight alliances um, that have been very contentious, right? There are, there are Catholics who really think that they're bad and they're not really teaching what the Catholic church teaches about the, about the, about same sex attraction. Uh, and then there are other Catholics who are like, okay, but this is good. At least we can start talking about it. And this all kind of came to a head when there was a school board trustee meeting recently where one of the uh, trustees was reading from the catechism about the issue and the other school board trustees basically shut that person down and was like, you can't read from that because some people might interpret it as hateful and some people might get offended because you're reading from the catechism. And that kind of blew up over the archdiocese and has people kind of talking about the issue now, uh, especially among youth ministers. We had a rather lengthy discussion about it in our last mm. uh, Zoom meeting because like, well, if this, this problem is obvious, or I wouldn't say problem, but situation in the schools has gotten to a point now where we can't really not work on finding a way to address it. Uh, in a way that actually has long lasting effects, right? Because we can talk about the issue, we can tell you what the teaching of the church is, um, but it's another matter entirely to really decide how pastorally the church is gonna, you know, embrace the situation to try to bring Catholicism into that situation. So uh, I brought a Manny, we're gonna talk about it. Uh, so why don't we start from the very beginning? Let's go back to like the very basic beginning of the entire issue. Why do we as Catholics use the term same-sex attraction instead of gay, lesbian, whatever else it is? Yeah, so this is a great question, a very important question. Um, so actually, you will meet a variety of different Catholics who um, are attracted to the same sex, who have differing opinions on this specific question. So I have met numerous Catholics who have called themselves gay Catholics or who call themselves gay Christians, lesbian Catholics, lesbian Christians, whatever. Um, however, I personally do not identify with like a gay catholic slang and here's why i don't personally um like that terminology and use it um is because at the end of the day i am catholic i am a catholic man i believe in the catholic church and all her teachings and that is at the core of it all that's my identity because ultimately your catholic identity roots down to your child of god i'm a son of god i'm a man of god 
that's how I'm choosing to live my life. That's how I'm directing my life. My attractions, my same-sex attractions, while yes, they exist, they are a part of my human experience. I don't know why they're there or how they got there, but I know that they are there. Uh, they are a part of my human experience. I'm not going to deny that. I'm not going to sit here and act like there's some, you know, small, like it's a part of me and it's a part of my experience. And um, it isn't something small, but at the same time, it's not my entire being. And I think our culture, especially today, the enemy is doing such a great job at distracting people from their ultimate identity in Christ. Um, and it's turning that in all ways, you know, gay, straight, black, white, this, that, you know, it's like, we've put all these labels on each other and all these, we box people up into these minimum parts of themselves rather than the whole person, which is son of God, daughter of God. Um, and so for me personally, I just say I'm Catholic because by saying gay Catholic, you're saying that your um, same sex attraction somehow, I guess, comes before your Catholic. I don't, I don't even really, I understand that they're using it because they're saying that that's a part of their experience. However, Ultimately, I'm a Catholic, so I don't say I'm a, you know, um, self-image struggling Catholic. I don't say I'm a straight Catholic. I don't say I'm a um, struggling with porn Catholic. So why would I say I'm a gay Catholic? Like, it's like our temptations and our struggles don't, don't override the fact that we're Catholic and we're children of God. So I say I'm Catholic who experiences same-sex attraction because same-sex attraction is a part of my human experience. I do experience it. So I, and some people might even say struggle with same-sex attraction. I don't say struggle just because I think, while it is a struggle in reality and it's not easy um, to, um, I guess, bear the weight of this cross um, because it is a heavy cross. I also don't like to think of it as a struggle because it kind of puts a negative connotation on it when in reality, while yes, it's a temptation that can be hard sometimes, it also has brought a lot of fruit in my life and has actually... Um, just shown a lot of goodness in my life in terms of my faith and drawing me closer to Christ and uniting him, uniting myself with his cross. So uh, that was kind of a drawn out answer, but that's why I prefer that we just say, dude, we're Catholics. And just like you might be a Catholic who struggles with um, self-harm or who struggles with uh, lust or pornography or whatever. I am a Catholic who struggles with or experiences same-sex attraction because yes, it's a part of my experience as a Catholic. But it's not who I am. It doesn't define me or my faith because I'm so much more than that and God sees me as so much more than that. So Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. We don't we don't uh we don't, you know, call porn addicts porn addicts, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we 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 don't say people who have things as attraction, we don't just define them by their attractions, right? Like it just it doesn't it, it, it makes it a lot harder to really talk about the heart of the issue which is this identity that you're created with because mm -hmm. god is our creator and when we start talking about it like oh i'm gay this i must be in this it kind of it's hard to really get to the root of what the catholic church teaches um mm -hmm. because we're so caught up in like identifying with this or identifying with that whereas we're all supposed to have that same, same identity in christ but um it can be hard to to get cut through all the noise sometimes um yeah, personally, I, I don't have an issue if somebody wants to call themselves a gay Catholic or a lesbian Catholic or whatever. Um, but, like, the actual issue itself is same-sex attraction, right? Like, I, I don't have an issue with the fact that you're gay, right? I don't even have an issue necessarily with the fact that you have same-sex attraction. It's just about, like, what is what, what should we do about it, right? That's what we're talking about. Right. Uh, okay. Um, so talk to me a little bit. So it, I, I've had, I've had, I've had met a range of people with same-sex attraction. Some people, they're, they're both attracted to the same sex and the opposite sex. I, I think the last time I talked with you for you was, it was always the same sex, right? Right from the beginning. Yeah, it was. I, yeah. um, yeah, I've, I, I wouldn't say right from the beginning. I'm not going to sit here and act like I was a baby. Who right. Was, like, no, of course, other of boys. course. But, um, I, yeah, I would say I've, for as long as, um, I can remember my hormones at least working. I was, I've always been attract physically attracted to men. Um, I've tried to be attracted to women. Like I've tried dating yeah. girls. Uh, tried pursuing that and I I don't know why but it <laughs> just doesn't work out right. so <laughs> yeah yeah well, well so what was growing up with that like how do I say this it was destructive <laughs> I would say it was very mm. destructive mm. in the sense of I destroyed myself because of it uh, my self-esteem was gone um, the way I looked at others was gone it was like my entire life, my entire existence felt like a failure and broken because of this, um, especially being a Catholic teenager. I, I felt like 
God had just completely messed up on me. I felt like he had created me broken and I'm not at all, you know, I'm, I'm not entering into the born this way, whether or not he created me with this. All I'm saying is like, I felt like in that moment as a teenager, I was like, why did he do this to me? What, like, why would he mess me up like this? What happened? Um, and it spiraled me into a huge, just um, self-hatred. I hated myself. I hated the church. I hated God. Um, I, I didn't want anything to do with Catholicism, Christianity, Jesus, um, because I hated him. And um, yeah, I despised um, everything that had to do with it because I felt like I was broken. I didn't belong in it. So yeah, after when you were going through all of that, what was, what was it that ultimately brought you back to the faith out of that, that, str- that struggle that you were in? As, as you said, destructive, right? Like how did you come back to the faith after all of that? Yeah, so um, I actually was born into a Catholic family. So by the grace of God, I'm a creative Catholic. Both my parents are very faithfully Catholic. So Jesus was always in our house. So I always knew who Jesus was. I just didn't know him on an intimate level. However, I would say it wasn't until, well, it was a number of things, but one of them for sure was just the fact that I wasn't fulfilled in my life. Um, I I did live, um, a part of my testimony is I did live a, life um that was kind of in alignment with the world's beliefs on just homosexuality and same-sex attraction so i did i dated men i was sexually active i partied a lot um i was always drinking or smoking i i embraced you know the flesh and i embraced earthly sin and there was always a part of me that felt empty for me i always tell people that like we were created by the creator and you know, we are his creation. We will not be fully fulfilled until we align ourselves with him again. And obviously you have to do that through the way that you choose to live. And I was not choosing to live in alignment with him. So therefore I didn't feel fulfilled because I wasn't in alignment with my creator, with my fulfiller. Um, so I would say it was a mix of that emptiness that was kind of just gnawing and burying my heart. Um, and then also to be quite honest, just part of my testimony too is, Um, I also was just really called out by God one night and um, it was kind of one of those sporadic, you know, insane God moments where God is just wakes you up from your sleep and he's like, all right, arise, you got to get out of your grave. And so that was kind of another part of the reason why I turned back to the church was because he kind of lifted the veil from my eyes and allowed me to see the life I was living in the whole, the grave that I was digging myself into by the choices I was making um, and again, this goes beyond same-sex attraction. It goes beyond the fact that I was dating men. I was doing all kinds of sinful things and sinful behaviors. So, yeah, it was just a mix of that. It was a mix of the awakening from God and then also just the the reason I was able to rise up from my grave was because I already felt dead in the grave. I didn't feel fulfilled in any way. So I was like, okay, might as well. Right. You hit bottom. You might as well. Yeah, exactly. See if this- <laughs> This thing that the salvation God's talking about is it's worth right. it's, it's worth something. Right. See if Jesus yeah. is actually as cool as Yeah, yeah. I think that man. every every Catholic knows that feeling of like just no fulfillment, right? Any yeah. Catholic who's ever been a Catholic um knows that feeling, right? The same attraction yeah. or not, like to just feel like in a grave, like unfulfilled. The things I'm doing in my life right now aren't fulfilling me. Uh, mm-hmm. And that struggle doesn't just change. That just struggle doesn't just go away, right? But when you Absolutely. start to see, when God is starting to call you to something greater to yourself, to a purpose greater than yourself, then that's all of a sudden you have something to work towards, uh, right? And that 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 happens a lot, especially when you're you're going into when you're in ministry, right? Like you gotta keep yourself centered on God, or you're gonna continually going through that. And going through that right at the beginning of your faith journey is probably part of the reason why you're you're where you are now with doing yeah. all these talks yeah. and stuff, right? Because you you've been to the bottom. You don't want to go back there again. If you could go back in time and tell your teenage self just like one thing to help them get through that, that tough time that you were in uh, the destructive habits, what, what do you think it would be? What was the one piece of advice you'd give yourself? The one thing I would tell my teenage self would be that God loves you Uh, because I really, I never believed it until I really changed my life around and I encountered him just through all kinds of different situations and people. But before I had my reconversion, I didn't believe that God loved me. I truly just thought that I was too broken, that I was too flawed, that I was too sinful um, for him to ever love me. I thought I was too far gone. And if I could just tell my, my teenage self anything, it would be that God loves you, even though you experience same sex attraction, even though you are struggling with these different sins, like God loves you and he wants he wants you. 
um, yeah, that would be what I would reiterate to my younger self. It's nice. Okay, so let's let's start talking about the the nitty gritty, right? This is Manny. This is who he is. You know, we've done the the overview. Um, let's get into the meat. Let's yeah. get into the meat. You know the. Uh, so I, I already mentioned about the trustee situation that, that happened here. Um, let's start with the, the, the most obvious question, right? Do you, do you think that the catechism and the teachings of the church that are in it are, are, are still meaningful um, to be used in high school? Like, is that something that we should still be using to influence our decisions on what we teach young Catholics? Yeah, so um, I would say personally, again, this is personal opinion, so don't take this as word of God, whatever. Um, for me personally, I think that the catechism's um, section regarding same-sex attraction, homosexuality, so it's 2357 through 2359, um, three paragraphs. But I think in those three paragraphs, the church does a tremendous job at addressing the topic efficiently and effectively. Um, and this might be an unpopular opinion, but I actually find the three paragraphs in the Catechism of the Catholic Church to be rather beautiful. I don't see them to be negative or hateful. Um, I actually think that they are firm in truth while also being, while still being compassionate and still making it very clear that these people experiencing same sex attraction need to be accompanied on their journeys and need to be walked with and need to be treated and handled and loved with care. So, in my opinion, I don't see the problem with somehow implementing them in a high school slash youth um, environment. Uh, because again, I think while, yeah, the truth might be difficult for some to process, the entire three paragraphs of the church teachings on this topic themselves do also have compassion and are very promising. Um, especially my favorite is the last line of the entire um, section. It says um, that those like myself, who experience same-sex attraction, who um, pursue, you know, the church's teachings on chastity, um, on, uh, you know, constant receiving of the sacraments, um, uninterested friendships, will eventually, per will eventually achieve what's Christian perfection. If that's not hopeful, if that's not cool, then I don't know what would be. And I think, like, even of my teenage self, if I had heard that, that would have brought me a lot more hope of my place in the church than just hearing you can't get married or you can't date someone like to hear the whole, like you can approach Christian perfection. That's pretty sick. So in my opinion, I think, yes, we should use the catechism, but we need to include the whole, the whole three paragraphs and not just you can't act in your attractions. That's it. Like we need to include right. all of it, including the accompanying and the compassion and what your life could look like if you do live out your vocation to holiness. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly like the same thing they used to have with that that line. And I think it's in the New Testament where it's like, you know, like, you know, homosexuality, you can't do that, right? When it's talking about the act and then everyone's like, oh, the Catholic Church hates gays. Oh my yeah, God, you... with all this hatred, guys, you got to fix your crap. Right what are you doing? It's like, did you read? Did you read it? Did you read yeah, it? Did you? Yeah. No? Okay. <laughs> well, then, Absolutely. you know, God, it's just, I think it's the same thing. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to say that the person who, who had, was angry about us using the catechism hadn't read it uh, or has read it and still thinks that it's bad. But like, I, I think it's great. I, I, you know, I think there should be more than three paragraphs, but I think it's great. <laughs> yes, I agree <laughs> right? with that. I do yeah. agree with that, that if they could have more on it, fantastic. But you know what? For what we do have and yeah. the three paragraphs that I mean, they but we're gonna have, a lot. We're going to have a hard time writing more than three paragraphs if they're all, already upset with the three paragraphs, right? Like, yeah, you know, it's just... Absolutely. I, I mean, ain't that the truth? That's <laughs> the know? truth right there, right there. Oh, like, nobody's nobody's going to go and study theology of the body if they think chastity is a load of crap. That's just... Yeah. Not, they're not going to, right? I, I don't know what... Absolutely. Nobody's going to go through that 2,000-page volume of John Paul II. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Do they make you read that at Franciscan? I hope they do. The theology of the body. For my own, own amusement, no, the whole two thousand page val for, like volume of all the things because I there's oh, like, different ad adaptations for like just like summarized parts. But like, are you talking about for TOB like Saint JP? Yeah, TOB? like the big the big honking thing. So I'm not gonna say they make us. I have not yet to read it. I've heard it. Is, <laughs> I've I'm yeah, not gonna lie. Good. I've heard it is very good, but very like um difficult to read. Like it's a very like complex. Oh, it's read. It's, it's not entertaining. Yeah, um, unless you like yes. reading, you know, two thousand pages about 
um, how sex is good. <laughs> about I feel like that gets good. I feel like that gets awkward at about page like yeah, <laughs> sixty like, or okay, seventy. Like, like okay, sex is good. Got it. Sex is good. All right, I get it. Now on to chapter that. five. Sex is Great. good. Cool. Like, oh, wow, <laughs> I can't make, believe we made it here. Amazing. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I mean, I think that's a good point to make, right? Like the the, the catechism is good. That's why we use it. What do you think that we can do? like youth ministers, young adult ministers, wherever you may be ministering to people who are coming to the church who may have questions about this or may be, uh, may have same-sex attractions, how do you think that we can approach the issue in a way that makes them feel at home in the church, that makes them feel welcome? Yeah, so I think um, one thing that just makes this such a, a sensitive topic, a sensitive question to address and to answer is the fact that these are youth that we're talking about. Um, these are young souls that we represent, like we could be the only representation of the church and of Christ to them. So you as a Catholic minister or Catholic teacher could be the representation of Catholicism to them. So we have to be so careful and so sensitive in the ways that we respond to them, especially if it comes to something like this. Um, I think the number one tip I would give would be if someone was, if a student was to come up to you and, you know, open up to you about their struggle with same-sex attraction or, um, uh, yeah, same-sex attraction or lust towards the same sex or whatever. Um, I would make it a point to just let them know that, to just remind them that they're loved um, and to keep them rooted in their identity in Christ. Um, to just start the conversation off with, um, you know, like, thank you for talking to me about this. Thank you for opening me up, uh, opening up to me. Uh, and I just want to affirm you that the church doesn't hate you because of this. God doesn't hate you because of this. God loves you. The church loves you. It, it, Jesus wants to accompany you like with your cross and on this journey. Because I think something that so many of those students and so many of those children face immediately is just, you know, you have to do this or you can't act on it. Or you, and it's like, we can't just throw such a harsh truth on them immediately because realistically it's not an easy pill to swallow. It is not easy for a kid who is surrounded by all these shows and magazines and books and blah, blah, blah. Talk a culture that just glamorizes, you know, acting on same sex attraction, living out in the LGBT community. Like we can't throw at them, you know, all of a sudden that this reality of, you know, you can't act on your attractions. You have to stay single you can't you know this that like that's especially for a child that's a lot to take in and that's very overwhelming and while yes the truth is important and i'm not saying we shouldn't because we need to at some point um gracefully and gently deliver them the truth um in the initial moment when they first open up we don't need to respond with slamming the catechism on them um, right. rather i think we should respond with a compassionate in a sense of like gentle like you are loved, Christ loves you, affirm them. Because again, they are probably more than likely questioning whether or not God and the Catholic church still wants them because of their attractions alone. Um, and so I think affirming that first and foremost, because if we affirm their identity and strengthen that identity of theirs as an identity in Christ, then they will direct their life towards that. Because if, if, if I believe in my heart that I'm a child of God, even if I experience same-sex attraction or any other temptation or human ap appetite i will know that i'm a child of god so that's how i need to direct my life and my choices but if i'm referred to as you know a you know gay man or whatever you know you're gay you're this you're that then of course why wouldn't i direct my life choices that way then if, if you're going to tell me that's what i am and uh, so that's why I also going back to the whole like gay catholic i think when we say like gay catholic or whatever we're just, like, I prefer just Catholic because that's how I direct my life. That's how I direct my choices and my actions is in the light of Catholicism and in Christ, not gay. Like, when you say gay, all of a sudden you're making that a part of your identity. That's not. That's not how you direct your actions. Oh, um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, in regards to children, I think we need to be compassionate um, and we need to affirm their identities in Christ and the fact that they belong in the church. Uh, because even those mere words alone – as strange and as simple as they may sound, they can make a massive impact on children. Children need to hear that, especially children who don't believe that they belong in the church and who doubt it. Those little words, that, that one sentence that God still loves you could save their mm -hmm. entire hope. In yeah. The church. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, 
And I think when 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 youth really ask that question, it, it it's not because like they like I think it can sometimes be taken like oh like this teen is coming and he's going to try and you know debate me about whether or not same sex attraction right. is should be sinful or not. Um, I think that they wouldn't even ask that question to begin with unless they they were struggling, right? Like mm. unless they they really thought like you know maybe I'm not happy Absolutely. right now and I want to be happy, right? What does the church say about this that leads to me being happiness? Like getting to happiness. I, I heard a I heard a story today in the weirdest place, um, like an analogy of like when you're when you're telling people to build a ship, right? You don't you don't say like, hey, you're gonna chop wood and you're gonna do this and you're gonna do that. You're like, okay, we're you know like point them towards the ocean and be like, that's where we're going. If you want to go there, then build the ship, right? And then at that point, they just kind of take care of themselves. Oh, I gotta go. I gotta go. I want to go on the ocean. I gotta do this part. You know, it's just you point them towards the goal, and they're much more likely to get the yeah. work done and actually want accomplish the goal than if you just you know, give them this sort of menial tasks. Like, you know, if we go, if we go to people with same distraction and be like, you can't do that because it's sinful. Um, we're, right. They're not going to be in the church very long. Right. right. Like if we go Absolutely. to them and be like, God has a plan for your future. God wants you with them in heaven. God wants you to approach perfection. God wants you Absolutely. to be happy. And these are the things that church teaches that allow that, that God has told us will help make you happy. Right. Um, I think they're much more likely to take that receptively than if we just start going around and telling people that they're sinners. Um, Amen. We need to make it, we need to make it hopeful because it is hopeful. We're not even making it hopeful. We need to speak that hope into them because it is hopeful and it's beautiful. Church teaching is so good and it's designed for our good. Like the church wills are good. They're not rules because they just want us to not, you know, sleep with the same sex or not act on our attractions. It's so much more than that. They're not rules. They're like, it's love. Like the church is saying this in um calling us this light to this way of living into this vocation out of love because they will our good and just like she wills the good of any other member of her body like it's all for our greater good um and i think if we focus on that and also bring a light of hope to it that you know your life won't be miserable um like will i still experience love of course you will like just because someone whether or not you are in a romantic relationship or not like love is so achievable because love is Jesus and you don't need yeah. to be married to encounter. Jesus. Well, I think every priest would agree with you, right? Like celibacy yeah. is not a, not a new concept in the church. Right. 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 Um, right. I think, I think it's, it, it takes a lot of courage for, for, for a youth to really talk about that. And it, it is hard, right? Like priests, when they, they get, make the choice to be priests, they make, they get to make that choice when they're older and they've right. had time right. to discern and pray. Right. You've basically been, been born with a, a call to celibacy. Yeah. Um, which can feel really daunting at times um, for anybody, uh, same sex attraction or not, right? Like to realize, like, oh, I'm called to celibacy. Mm. Well, dang, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm glad that you mentioned vocation at the end there because, like, if you really think about it, only one of the vocations of the four that Catholics can do is is non celibate. Every yeah. all the other all yeah. the paths to holiness in the church are, are celibate celibate paths to <laughs> holiness. You know, like, it's right, just, right. there's just the one. Right. right. And, and you got to get going. You got to raise kids and there's all this whole thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let them do that. The rest of us. Right. This, you guys like you get to be at the forefront of like bringing the church to holiness, which I think is super cool. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. It's it's just that whole I could go on a rant about this, but this, that, <laughs> whole, that whole glamorization of romance in our society today that we have really our culture has turned romantic relationships into an idol that we worship yeah. the idea of being in a romantic relationship, being married to someone or even just dating someone will fix our problems, will give us happiness, will give us fulfillment when that's not true. It's marriage yeah. isn't a cure to loneliness. Yeah. No, it is married never- people are still lonely. Married people can still be miserable. Like it, it doesn't fix your problems. It's it still like all of our vocations, like none of our vocations fix our problems because ultimately Christ fixes our problems. Oh yeah. And we've, we've forgotten that, that our relationship with God is supposed to be a romantic one. Right. right. Like, God, are, God uh, romances yeah. us more than anybody, right? God romances me more than my wife. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just yeah, the truth yeah. of it. You know, Absolutely. He's the one who never stops coming after me regardless of whatever's Absolutely. going on. Amen. Um, and that person you can always depend on. So I think that we need to start talking about it in that way for sure. Um, but I think that we also need to acknowledge, right, there are some major pitfalls in the way that the church um, and ministry has tried to deal with the problem in the past. What do you think are the major, like, uh, I don't want to, like, state stereotypes or, like, things that, the church, things that people in the church do when addressing the issue that can often be more harmful than good? Oh, I know. This is good. Um, it's <laughs> okay. not good. It's not good. That's it's the not good. Act. Right. Actually, it's not good, but it's, <laughs> this is great that this is coming up. 
Um, one would be for me in the catechism, so it specifically states that the desires themselves are um, objectively disordered. Because in reality, I mean, just like so many other human desires, because again, if you look at the catechism, whenever people bring this up, I always find it almost humorous because if you look in the catechism, there are other desires that are listed as disordered. Same-sex attractions is not the only one because again, we are broken people. We're fallen human beings. So we all desire things that are disordered, that are not in order with God's original design for us. It's, that's just reality. Like if that offends you, I'm sorry, but like that we all, because we're broken, we're all, none of us are perfect. And so for me, I think one thing that I see very common is that people will take that line of the attractions are objectively disordered and turn it into the person has a disorder when the person doesn't have, I mean, I can't, we don't know exactly the science behind same sex. Right, right. Know, I mean, we don't know the psyche. So who am I to say whether or not the, you know, mental disorder or whatever, but at the same time, to treat it as a disorder because people will read that as oh they have a disorder they're sick they need to be healed they need to be treated like a patient it's like oh yeah like what is it like uh, I, I don't think we have this up here but like i've heard stories of like gay therapy like yeah it's price like, the gay out or something it's yeah like, it's like <laughs> that's not gonna first work of all, first of all let me say that like time has proven that those therapy treatments don't work if you expose right. a child to heterosexual pornography or you know force them to constantly be praying the gay or whatever more than likely it's it, like nothing like it's not working so clearly this has been around since biblical times we don't know why it's around we could go into a whole lengthy discussion about the origin but we're not going to we don't know why it's around and it's not about necessarily why it's here it's about where you're going mm -hmm. and for me i think when you treat it as like this is someone who experiences same-sex attraction they're they're broken, they're disordered, they are disordered, and they need to be fixed. It's like, that is such a flaw, and that's not what the church teaches. The church doesn't teach that the person is disordered. It teaches that the desire is disordered. But it also doesn't teach that the desire needs to suddenly be fixed and cured for them to be a whole, you know. It teaches that they need to pursue abstinence. And if the desire somehow dissipates or, you know, goes away, then great. That happens to some people. I can tell you it has not happened to me personally. Do I know if it ever will? I can tell you. Like, it's not, that's not what I wake up hoping. I don't wake up hoping right. that I'm going to be cured because I'm not sick, you know? Like, it's <laughs> yeah, more, exactly, like, yeah. it's more I wake up hoping that I can be holy. Um, and so I guess that would be one flaw that I would say of, again, it's not the church itself. The church itself, what it teaches is beautiful. Even the wording, I don't think it's bad at all. I think, However, the people interpret it as it's a disorder. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I think that that could be flawed when you treat the person like they're a patient or a disordered pa a patient with a disorder. Um, I would say another flaw would probably be just the lack of compassion, I think, around it, around the topic. I think especially when addressing the call, the vocation to abstinence, because, um, again, it's not something little. Um, a call to abstinence, potentially lifelong abstinence, is not something that's just, you know, oh, you got to no. be single the rest yeah. of your life. Like, and I think some people are so quick to just deliver it as that, that, you know, dude, you know what you got to do, right? You just can never get married. It's like, that's not, the, <laughs> like, that's kind that's of big. harsh. Yeah, right. And so I don't blame so many people for running away from the church when that's all they hear. So I think we also could do a better job at being a lot more compassionate and gentle in the way we deliver. And again, also bringing hope into that single vocation that if you are called to lifelong singleness, if that's what the Lord's calling you to, if these attractions never go away and you have to be abstinent all your life, it's still going to be a good life. And it's going to be a joyful life and a fruitful life and, a, and like an abundantly just fulfilling vocation. And I think yeah. we need to speak more life into that as well. Um, Cause I think it can seem like a very miserable, um, just a lonely vocation also because we don't have a lot of examples to be no it's honest. true yeah it's not like we we have this list of saying to be like oh yeah these yeah. are all the but it's the same yeah. for married people too like even married people we have a hard time finding saints right are like right know, same time though it's all abstinent people that are the majority of our saintly figures yeah we'll say so absolutely <laughs> uh, and you also just you don't go into marriage not expecting there to be abstinence if you're doing that then you're uh, you're gonna have a lot of babies Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's the thing I tell people. I'm also like, like it's still part of it. It's just, it's just right. Well, some it's people just... will, ask, some people will like to me, like Manny, like, I just, 
I don't know how like you're never going you never going to engage in like such a, like how can you go that long? I'm like, dude, like you do realize you will not be like engaging in the like marital act with your wife twenty four seven, right? No. I mean, you I guess you could, but then you'd be yeah. Like, it it things, reminds me of people like, when people like at my wedding would be like, hey, like you know your life's over, you, you can't date any more girls anymore, like you just you know whatever the wife wants is yeah, what happens, you know. It. You're just just like I didn't sign it up for slavery, like right? What's going on? <laughs> yeah, like what is <laughs> you know, this? I didn't get married because i didn't get married because i had to i chose right this, right, right? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> no absolutely uh, man it's absolutely. yeah but i think that's just part of the same problem that we have or like yeah not just like the society but catholics themselves don't really understand the teaching of vocation yeah right absolutely um and that makes it very hard to find happiness if you don't really understand how god gives us happiness in this life absolutely right? um what's what's what do you say is the one quintessential thing that the church can offer people with same-sex attraction that society can't like what's, what's, if you were to pitch somebody like, this is the best thing that has happened to me, the best thing that I've experienced in my face since I like really do- dove into it, what would it be? Freedom. Mm. I would say freedom because, um, you know, we can try to find freedom in all earthly things. Like I tried to find it through, you know, romantic relationships with men through, um, um, you know sexual deviancy through like drinking through smoking i tried to find it through all kinds of different things that the world was telling me would free me but i was never freed in fact it only just left me more chained up and more a slave to myself but when embracing a life with the church i found an experience and continue to experience freedom because i experienced jesus and jesus christ is freedom and it's one of those things that you will never fully be able to comprehend it or understand it until you chase after Jesus. And even then we will still never be able to fully comprehend it until we hit the grave. But Jesus is freedom. And I don't know how to describe it. I just, what I tell people is having lived a life, you know, like taking on that whole, you know, gay identity and living with the LGBT community and whatnot. um, And having lived that, you know, freedom according to the world, I can say now living, you know, in accordance with Catholic church teachings, um, living an absent life that I feel I've never known myself better. Um, I feel like I've never been more loved um, by others, felt more loved. I feel like I've never felt more confident. I feel like I have never felt more just free and happy because, um, again, like without Jesus, there isn't freedom. Uh, We can have temporary little buzzes of what feels like freedom but we won't experience true ultimate freedom until we unite ourselves with christ and the church offers that um and this goes beyond same sex attractions this goes for everything like the church offers freedom because she offers jesus and whether you are living you know whatever earthly life you're living full of earthly sin flesh whatever like at the end of the day you will not feel the fulfillment you're going to feel than you will in the church because you're not going to find freedom unless you come to Jesus. Um, So that would be my kind of to, that would be my word if I had to pitch to someone as cliche as it is, like that's so clear, you know, like, Oh, you'll be free. Like it's like at the same time, it's, I just speak from personal experience. Yeah. It may be cliche, but it's true. And yeah, exactly. And honestly, if you think I'm being cliche, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to, I want you to be free too. You know, like I just want, everyone to experience the freedom because I wouldn't want anyone to ever not experience him. So Mm. going from that, what do you, what do you think is is a lot of, a lot of, at least I speak from my own experience, a lot of my teens in my job as youth minister deal with this issue on a day to day basis, right? Where there's, it's all constantly being brought up. They they probably have friends who, um, you know, uh, say they're transgendered or they're, they're gay or they're lesbian or whatever. Right. Uh, and they, this, this, they get asked this, right. Cause they're like, they're like the Catholic kid, like, you know, like, Oh, you go to church and stuff. Like, what do you think about this? You know, doesn't the church hate gays or whatever? Um, what do you think that they can do to help defend the faith when posed like questions with this? Um, I'm not saying that they, that this should be the responsibility, but I am saying, right. Like this is something that's happening. What do you think that they should do when they're, they're posed with a situation like that? Yeah, I think, um, I think that, when someone is kids or just anyone in general, when they're posed with that question of like, well, doesn't the Catholic church hate gays or doesn't the Catholic, aren't they homophobic or whatever? Um, I think that ultimately this, again, this is a very cliche answer, but I think ultimately 
we can speak for ourselves through the way that we love whoever is prompting that question. So if someone who identifies as lesbian is coming up to me and saying, you know, well, doesn't Jesus hate me? Doesn't the church hate me? Don't, don't Catholics hate gays? I could tell her all I want with my words, you know, like, I don't hate you. The church doesn't hate you, etc. which I do think it is. I do think if need be, we should say, you know, the Catholic church doesn't hate gay people. God doesn't hate gay people. Jesus doesn't hate gay people, etc. But I think what's even more powerful is through our example, through the way that we love that person by continuing to be their friend, continuing to um, love the different parts of their lives. Um, because again, there's so much more than just their sexual attraction. Like they are a whole human being and we can still love their wholeness. Um, I think by loving that person, by being their friend, by um, just keeping them um, in our circle and by not just immediately cutting them off or, you know, shunning them away, we'll ultimately show that person that, whoa, like, I guess this kid says he's faithfully Catholic and he's still talking to me. He like, you know, he still wants to be my friend. This is weird. I thought Catholics hate gays. And then it can lead them kind of, we can show them Jesus's face through the ways that we love. Um, and again, that's very cliche, but I think that ultimately can be like, continue to be that person's friend. Again, that doesn't mean loving them doesn't mean supporting them in everything they do. You know, like you, you should not be encouraging them if they are, um, you know, um, pursuing something that isn't good for them. Like, just like any other person, if your younger sister, older brother, friend, whatever is, you know, um, wanting to jump off a house, wanting to spend a million dollars on a car when they only have $30 in their bank account, whatever, like you wouldn't support them in that. You don't support people in things they do wrong uh, or things that aren't good for them. So at the same time, I think like, yes, don't um, support them in their wrongdoings. Don't support just like you wouldn't support anyone in something they're doing that would hurt them. But it doesn't mean that you can't be their friend. There's this whole like just false idea in our culture and our world say that if you disagree with someone, you cannot love them. And that's not how love works. Like since when did loving someone mean agreeing with every single thing that they say, do and are, that's not yeah. what love is. And so that would be my advice would still love that person. Even if you two disagree on this topic, sh- like check up on that person, ask them how their day is going, compliment them on their like clothes that, like one day, like, you know, like make sure that person knows that you are still their friend, their loved one. And you still love them because ultimately Jesus did that. He sat with tax collectors and prostitutes. And yeah. I think that again, he showed them his face through the way he loved. And I think that we can show him, show them our faith, uh, Jesus's face through the way yeah. that we love them. So yeah, I, I definitely think there's that temptation nowadays to like have a church where we, we have the Pharisees and the Sadducees for all these people who supposedly mm-hmm. know about Jesus. And these are the people that I'm having dinner with. And these right. people are going to help me get to heaven because they would never, t- and you know, and then Jesus is right. sitting over here with the, the, the prostitutes and the tax collectors and whatever, right? right? Like, right. J- if you're going to start judging people for being sinners, you're going to have to put yourself at the front of the line. Right. Yeah. It's just, that's just yeah. the dilemma of being a Catholic. Like you just, yeah. you can't sit here and be like, yeah, that person's so bad. They sin so much. Oh my gosh. They have yeah, same-sex right. attraction and they act on it. Wow. Whoa. I would yeah. never do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. Like it's just, it's a, uh, yeah, absolutely. We have to focus on loving them. Um, but again, like we can't, like, we can't just back down too. Right. We can't just be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with whatever you do. No, no, right. you gotta, right. if you, if you really believe in what you believe in, you have to be able to, take a stand right um right. at the same time though you got to be able to listen to what the other side says right you can't just mm, sit there and be like catholic church is right about everything you just right. go read what the catholic church says it's like no no you got to be able yeah. to hear what the other side yeah. says if you really believe what you're what you believe in is right then you'll be okay with hearing an opposing opinion yeah um, absolutely i think that both of those things like we don't we don't do that enough right? and i think yep. teens are being placed in the middle of this right especially when they're getting they're getting yeah. berated by teachers like you know, you can't think that that's wrong. That's hateful. Right. right. It's they, no t- student should have that responsibility. Right. And I, I would love to fight those battles for my teens as often as I can, but I can't be there every day in their classroom. Right. It's uh, yeah, absolutely. It's tough. Um, if, if you had a friend, right. Who was having a gay wedding, would you go? I knew that this was going to, I, yeah, I just, I, I, you said just, interesting it's question. A tough I question. Like, yep, this it's, is it, it really, out, yeah. Um, so basically look, can you attend a gay wedding gay wedding as a faithful catholic um so again this is my personal opinion um so in my personal opinion i would say no 
Um, I would say no, you cannot attend a gay wedding um, because at the end of the day, um, I think, um, you know, like a, a gay wedding, right? It's a ceremony celebrating um, two people of the same sex um, engaging in a quote unquote, you know, gay marriage, like two people of the same sex marrying per se. And I think as faithful Catholics, it almost seems hypocritical to say, this is what marriage is. This is what we believe. And yet attend a ceremony that celebrates the opposite of that. Because in reality, it's a wedding. It is celebrating it. Um, like there's no part of a wedding where, unless where the you know priest would ask, is anyone opposed <laughs> to this matrimony? You get up. Like, it's like, there is no part of the wedding where you are, like it's all about celebration. It's not about disapproval or uh, not being okay with the marriage. It's all about celebrating the marriage. So I think being in attendance of a gay wedding, in my opinion, sh means showing support, even if that's not your intention. Mm -hmm. And I know so many people who have attended because they're just, you know, like if I don't attend this many. I will lose my brother or I will, my son will never talk right. to me again or whatever, whatever. Um, so I know that a lot of people, that's not their intention when they attend those weddings and they are faithfully Catholic or Christian. I know that their intention is not to show support. And they will say like, I'm not in the, I'm not in the crowd or in the pews because I want to show support. I'm there because I love them. It's like, okay. But if you, for me, at least, um, if you love someone that much, you would love them enough to not support them in something that they're doing that's wrong. And by being there and showing attendance, you are making it clear that you in some form or capacity don't discourage what is happening. And as faithful Catholics, I think that we should discourage what is happening because what is happening isn't what we believe. What we believe is that a marriage is a divine institution between a man and a woman and anything other than is not a valid marriage in the eyes of Catholic church. And so that would be my opinion. However, what I always tell people is, especially when you have a loved one or someone close to you who does like, let's say invite you to a gay wedding and you don't show up, that's going to hurt that person. And I think we need to really, really like be able to empathize with those individuals who don't have their, you know, parents attending their wedding or their, you know, best friend going to their, you know, um, like marriage with, you know, same sex or whatever. Um, because that's a, that's a milestone, you know, like a marriage, a wedding is a big deal. Like that is a yeah. milestone in someone's life. And whether you are Catholic or not, like, I think it's completely ignorant to ignore the fact that like to ignore that person's, you know, um, those person's feelings of like, you are, you are blatantly saying that you are going to like not be in attendance of a big milestone in their life and that's hurt that hurts and that stings and that's going to be difficult to um work through with whoever it is that you are saying that to whether it's your best friend your sister your brother your uncle your aunt whatever that is a difficult situation that's a sensitive situation um and all i can say in that is that i do tell people that whenever there is a situation where like let's say you don't go to the wedding i think in my opinion we, you should still make it a point that around the time of the wedding per se, like whether it's beforehand, afterwards, whatever, check up on the person. Like, don't let this be like the end all like, Oh, like we're just going to not go to the wedding and then we're never going to talk to you again. Like, no, like again, just because you disagree with what's going on there doesn't mean that you need to stop loving the person or you need to stop, um, you know, being in that person's life per se, because I think that that person still like, I don't think it should be an end all like, we don't want anything to do with you now per se um, because we all make decisions that we don't agree with. And that is, you know, engaging in a uh, same sex union is something that as faithful Catholics, we can't agree with. doesn't mean we can't still love someone though, who's engaged in a same sex uh, marriage. So I, that would be my opinion on the topic. Um, I don't know your thoughts on it. Uh, Very I, sensitive. I I don't know. It, it is sensitive. I, I get into disagreements about this particular question with, with my Catholic friends all the time. My personal opinion is if it were just a friend, I wouldn't go. But if it were like my son who was having the gay wedding, I might be more, more inclined to actually try and go. Um, 
just because like, if I don't go right, like, it, will I ever salvage that relationship? Will I ever right. be able to help that person when they're ready to come back to the faith? If I don't go right, if that relationship is completely cut off. Um, and I mean, obviously the answer to that could be yes. Right. Like if, the, if, you, if your son knows what you believe in, what you stand for there, that's not going to change. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's hard, right. When you talk about like people who you're really close to, and I don't think anybody who you're really close to would know, would not know what your opinion is on the matter. Right. Um, and I don't think that we should, we should like, we should go back on that. I just think like, it's, it's hard because like, you have to try and decide like how big of a, am I showing support by the, am I showing support for the gay marriage by going to the wedding or are I showing support for the person because mm-hmm. I love them? Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm doing one, if I'm doing the first one, then I can't go at all. Right. But if I'm going just, and I, that person knows I'm just going for that reason, I think maybe it's okay. But at the same time, I've never been in that situation. I never had right. to really think right. about that. Um, it's tough, right? Like, is that kind of, que- that question really like challenges, like how firm are we going to stand on yeah. this, right? Yeah. yeah. Where do we draw Absolutely. the line between like, I love this person and I deal with the same sex attraction thing after, or like, do I deal yeah. with like the same sex attraction thing first because I can't really love that person if I'm not telling them the truth. It's like you said too, like, especially I think when it's so fascinating to me that people, you know, when it comes to same sex attraction, Catholicism, Everyone is so quick to, you know, say like, this is what the church teaches This is, you know, dot, dot, dot. But then when it involves, when it becomes a personal connection to the topic. So whether you have a child who experiences same sex attraction or a friend or a loved one who experiences it, then all of a sudden it becomes real. Where then people Mm -hmm. are like, whoa, wait, I have to stand like, whoa, wait, I can't do like, I can't attend their wedding or I can't you know, support them in adopting a child or this, this, and that. Mm-hmm. And then when it becomes a, when it's a personal relationship involved, then it becomes real and then it becomes challenging. Um, and so like, it's like you said, it's, it's very hard and it, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it is so sensitive, especially um, the more that, um, you know, uh, you know, with the legalization of same sex unions um, only being a couple of years ago with the more that society and culture is um, just pushing it and, accepting it and endorsing it it is so so challenging mm-hmm. for us as faithful catholics to basically well i mean it's been legal in canada for a long time but has it okay <laughs> like okay 30 years now or something really a long time wow yeah wow. We, we yeah we're we're a little different up here uh, wow i, I well, don't know least, if it's good or not at least for the united states like that's what i'm yeah. saying is like it to me i just it's like you said, I'm not going to lie. I have not been in the situation yet where mm-hmm. someone close to me, I do have family members who um, are attracted to the same sex and live out their attractions. I do. Um, but I have not been in the situation yet where it has gotten to a same sex, um, you know, cere- union ceremony where I've been invited and have to blatantly say no. Um, I pray that God gives me the grace and the compassion that I need um, during those moments of, you know, if I am invited, which I very likely will be to stand firm. Uh, but again, it's, it's hard because you have to guide, you have to navigate it with compassion and with mm-hmm. gentleness, because this is such a sensitive topic that the other person rightfully so like, you know, it's very sensitive for them because this is what they see as like a monumental milestone in their life. And it, I completely empathize with the fact that somebody would be upset about it because while I don't agree with it and while I, I mean, you have to think from that person's perspective of like, I can understand why they would be upset. But again, it's, yeah, it's difficult. It's very difficult. Um, So yeah, it's one of those things where it is a huge test of faith and it really does come down to like, like, are we willing to stick with Jesus or stick with others, (laughs) which is so harsh and scary and um terrifying and we won't really be able to answer that correctly until we're actually faced with it because we can say all we want right now yeah i would say no i would give my life for you i would take a bullet for you jesus whatever but then it's like okay but when that moment actually happens would you do it you know um so yeah yeah no it's, it's tough for sure um i mean that's my last question do you have any <laughs> comments or, or, or <laughs> we ended it with a bang we ended with a bang. Last, i'd say to save the, the banger question. for the end just the like for the end just uh any anything you want to <laughs> you want to wrap with up with on the topic yeah i would just say you know for uh anybody watching specifically i don't know maybe parents educators ministers people who are you know dealing with youth and children who experience uh same sex extraction or maybe don't experience that or just faced with you know everything that the culture is throwing at us say um I would say just to 
again, our culture today is just completely spewing out all kinds of different ideologies and different um, perspectives regarding this topic. And so our, my generation and the generations after me are going to be fed more and more and more overwhelming information regarding this topic. Um, and more than likely, it is not going to be information in line with the church's teaching. It's going to be more gay couples on the TV, more, you know, um, famous celebrities coming out as gay, more endorsements of that, more this, more that. Like, more than likely, it's going to be continuous gay pride, um, uh, gay pride, like, um, just information being thrown left to right. And so I think, like, as an educator, as a parent, as just a faithful Catholic, we need to also be able to empathize with our children, with our students, um, and with the youth of today, just of where they're at in terms of like how overwhelmed they must be mm-hmm. on this topic and the information that's being thrown at them. So in the way that we choose to deliver the truth and the way that we choose to deliver the church's teaching, we need to always be keeping that in mind. So like, let's say they start to question it. Like, let's say we tell them church's teaching, they're immediately, you know, like, well, I don't believe that because this, this, and this, we can't get mad We can't all of a sudden just snap at them and, you know, you're wrong. Like, it's like you have to empathize with the fact that these children are being fed more and more just, um, just like, just, oh, like it's, it's so much and it's so overwhelming. And (laughs) I can only, I can, I can't even imagine. Like, I think back to when I was a kid and I'm like, oh my gosh, my like nieces and my little brother are like getting so much more information than I ever had access to. And it's a lot and it, it's very swaying. And um, yeah, I think what matters most here is that we need to treat those who experience same sex attraction with compassion because that's what the church calls us to, mm-hmm. whether they are not acting on their attractions and living out an absent life, or they are, you know, acting on their attractions and living, you know, uh, a life, you know, in alignment with the world's views on sexuality. You need to love that person as Christ did, which means with compassion, um, so it is not our duty to condemn them to hell. It is not our duty to treat them like they're so much more of a sinner than we are. Because ultimately, you know, like, who are you to point out the, the, the log, the splinter in someone else's eye when you have a log in your own, you know? So it's like, we need to just do our part of following church teaching, which talks about, you know, accompanying those with compassion. So mm-hmm. um, love that person the best you can. Um, again, even if they're doing something you disagree with, ask them how their day is going. Um, ask them how their job is. Ask them how, you know, life is like, there's so much more than this experience and so much more um, than their attractions. So that would be my leaving note. It's just to love um, your neighbor as yourself and to see Jesus in that person, whether they experience the same attraction or not, and whether they act on their attraction or not um, to see Jesus in that person and try your best to love that person as Jesus would, because ultimately many of them don't think that Jesus still loves them or Jesus would love them because of their attractions. And so prove them wrong by the ways that you love them and the ways that you show them Jesus. So that would be my closing note. Yeah. Yeah. I would just, I, the only thing I would add to that is that we just need to talk about it more. Right? Yeah. Like I, I, we just, yeah. it needs to become a topic that's normal yeah. to talk about in the church. Like yeah. priests should be able to talk about Absolutely. it from the pulpit. Um, Absolutely. Youth ministers should be able to talk to their teens about it and not be, um, worried about what the result will be because at the end of the day, if we don't talk about it at all, we're doing more harm, right? And it's okay to, yeah. to go out there and make a mistake and learn from it than to not talk about it at all because that, then you're really hurting those people who need that message of love um, when, they need, when they need it most, right? Uh, Emmanuel Gonzalez, <laughs> uh, I know you keep telling me to say that because then people will be able to find you, but you know, yeah, yeah, uh, I told, we're, yeah, we're going yeah. to the plug session. So you, section, <laughs> so, you know, I gotta, I gotta do it right. So where you can find me. Um, so I have social media. Uh, I am mainly active on Instagram. So you can find me at Instagram at call me Manny uh, with two Y's at the end. So three Y's total um, on there. I post all about the faith and I also post a lot about my journey with um, experiencing same sex attractions as a faithful Catholic. Um, I also do have a YouTube channel, which is just under the name uh, Emmanuel Gonzalez. Um, I'm not as active on it anymore, unfortunately, just because of school and just life in general. The Lord has kept me really busy. But I have over, I think, like 15, 20 videos on there regarding same sex traction that you can check out. Um, I also have a blog site, What a Beautiful Cross. Um, and on there as well, I'm not as active at the moment, but I do have several blogs up about experiencing same sex extraction. And I do also just have a number of different resources, different panels I've done, different 
um, talks that I've given as well. Yeah, and, that, and they can uh, find that all on your Instagram, right? You can find those links in the description below. Yes, there we go. You like can a find real YouTuber. I yes. did it like a real YouTuber. There you go. You can I'm find a real YouTuber as opposed to in months. I got there it, guys. You, he's got it. You can kind find of sort of... all the links in the description below. There we go. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, yeah, thanks again. Awesome. Thank you guys for watching. God bless all of you. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.